Hi, Scott, how you doing? So, we're going to cover issue 3 of the Mask UK comic, which is dated from the 22nd of November through to the 5th of December 1986. Now, if you're anything like me, if you collected the UK comic, it got to the point where the artistry was so good that you just looked at the vehicles and you thought, do you know what? I could quite easily climb into that vehicle and drive it away. So back when I was a 13 year old kid, when this comic came out, that's what I wanted to do. And now, as a 47 year old man, I'm waiting to get my chance. Now luckily, because it's a UK comic, it's a right hand drive version of the vehicle. So let's do a couple of things. First of all, safety belt on. It's got to be safe. And to take us right back to the 80s, we need the correct sunglasses. So let's put some aviators on. And then let's drive through this issue of mask. TV series and a great new comic so we already know this from issues 1, 2 and the TV issue and it says too big for just a cover centre pages colour poster rhino the ultimate driving weapon now it gives us some information to say that we can make our own mask special colour page inside and on the cover when we open it up we see rhino um, in action and it says the mighty rhino vehicle demonstrates its amazing ejection seat, sending an unsuspecting victim catapulting out of the passenger door. So on the back page we see this guy flying out and he's got a gun that's come out of his hand and then we see Rhino's ATV being driven by Bruce Sato in the background. Now obviously we're getting to the point now where the action is really on the front cover of the comic. The previous comics had some tremendous covers but this one I think beats them all by far so far this one is just absolutely awesome and as it says we will see Rhino in the centre pages so let's drive forward and see what we've got Monster Mountain Part 2. So if you remember last week Sly Rax had this job, he was to take this um, weapon underneath this uh, mountain to cause a, a volcanic eruption. Um, Matt, Scott and T-Bob were visiting the Frankenstein Museum. So let's see how they get on. So as it says, on vacation in the Bavarian Alps, Matt Tracker and his adopted son and the robot T-Bob at the Frankenstein Museum when incredibly the top blows off a nearby mountain. So obviously we see panic ensuing, 
we see the volcanic eruption, we see people running for their lives, uh, bits of um, lava and um, rocks getting thrown out of the uh, top of the volcano and um, landing on top of vehicles. Now luckily, Matt, Scott and T-Bob managed to make their way to Thunderhawk which is sat nearby. And obviously Matt is already wearing his Thunderhawk fatigues. So that's brilliant, that makes it easy, he's already got his flight suit on. So he just gets in the car and then takes off. So the lava flow is then coming down and Matt mentions that there are villages on the side of the mountain and obviously the lava flow is heading towards one of the mountains. So Thunderhawk swoops in, uh, uses a vaporizer ray and the steam them, uh, to steam and everything goes away. So then it says, yeah, but there is more behind. I've only given those villagers a few moments of time to get clear. So we know that there's still danger. He's cleared some of it, but the danger is still there. So let's drive on to the next page. As we drive into this page, basically there's another slope and there's now a torrent of cascading molten rock. So what happens is, Matt says, that's going to come down on Geshemil village itself. This is where the museum was, where the trackers were. Um, so basically the order to fire a proton bomb and it diverts the, all the molten lava because it creates this channel and all the molten lava then makes its way away from all of the villages and it helps protect the people. We then move on to the next page and what happens is Sly Rax has now set off the bomb, he's gone into this tunnel underneath this mountain to create the bomb, to create the lava. So he's now coming out, Miles and Mayhem is obviously pleased with himself that everything has gone fine. Cliff Dagger on the other hand isn't quite sure, he's not sure well, what we're we doing, why, why are we setting off a, a volcano, this just doesn't make any sense to me. So Miles Mayhem pulls out this book and tells him again about the giant of Gishmel, about this one-eyed cyclops giant monster. And basically what the plan is, is that the lava will burn down all the trees, it will melt all the ice, and hopefully, for Miles Mayhem, this will then reveal the giant, which will then allow him to take control of this giant to do his nasty work. So let's move on and see what happens on the next page. stopped on the last page of this particular strip. So it says, meanwhile Thunderhawk has been effective in saving at least some of the local people. So that's good, we know that we've managed to save some of the people. However, Matt Tracker is still worried and he says, the southwestern slope of Eagle Mountain, Scott, just look at that. Under that lies the old glacier. Remember what the museum guy told us about the giant of Gishmel? And Scott re replied, but you didn't believe him about this. And then Matt thinks, well, do you know what? If Miles Mayhem believes it, and if Miles Mayhem is here causing all of this hassle, it must be true. So this is where Matt realises he has to call in the rest of the mass team. So, again, quite a good story. Artwork is quite good. So we then move on to our first colour strip of this particular issue. So we started off the Great Head Robbery in, part in, in the first issue of the comic. So that's us now on to issue 3 and we have the Great Head Robbery Part 3. So basically we have the Statue of Liberty, if you remember from the previous uh, couple of issues, the head's been swapped over, Venom have taken control and they've put some guns inside. So what's happening is, is Miles Mayhem is barking orders at Cliff Dagger, telling him to rain fire down on the Manhattan skyline. So that's what he's doing and we see an image of fire coming out of the uh, mouth of the Statue of Liberty. Um, all the people are trying to escape as buildings get destroyed and fall down on top of them. We then move to inside uh, the head of the Statue of Liberty and we see the gun that um, 
cliff dagger is now using. And we start to see a familiar shape here. We're starting to see a shape that looks a bit like Jack Hammer. So what we'll do is we'll think about this and think, well, why does it look a bit like Jack Hammer? And we'll move on to the next page. As we arrive onto the next page, we've got Miles Mayhem saying, Then stage three of my magnificent massive plan commence and put Venom firmly in a position to rule the Western world. So basically the main objective is, is to destroy Manhattan, somehow take over the world. Um, I'm sure he's got his own thoughts on how he's going to do that. So we then have Matt Tracker and Bruce Sato having a conversation. Now, Matt Tracker is in his Thunderhawk, sorry, he's now in his um, Ultra Flash um, uniform. And we see him talking about the fact that Thunderhawk is still damaged and that Buddy Hawks has a crew of repair repairers on it just now. We then see some mechanics wearing um, overalls with masks written on the back, working on Thunderhawk, and obviously Buddy Hawks is overseeing. He doesn't seem to be getting his hands to himself. So, what that then means is, is they then have to use Rhino. So Matt and Bruce jump into Rhino, they drive along and they head to the end of a, a jetty. When they get there, it opens up into battle stations, they fire a missile and they miss completely. They, they miss the Statue of Liberty completely. Then we see in the back of Thunderhawk is Alex Sector and he's obviously giving them a row. He's like, well, wait a minute, gents, you've not given me the time to get the coordinates to actually fire on the head of... Uh, the Statue of Liberty. So if you want to waste more missiles, keep firing on. But if you don't, then basically let's let's get the coordinates ready so we can fire the next thing. So they're trying to get the correct elevation. We then go back into the head of the Statue of Liberty, and we find out that it is actually Thunderhawk. Uh, sorry, that uh, it's Jackhammer that Cliff Dagger is firing from. So we see him. He's firing from um, Jackhammer, but because it's so high. And because it's inside the Statue of Liberty, he can't move the cannons down far enough to actually shoot them. So what then happens is Miles Mayhem tells uh, Rax that it's up to him and he has to get into the Piranha Sub. So let's see what happens on the next page. just in time to see the Piranha submarine take off and splash down into the water. So as we know, Rhino is on the end of this jetty pier, trying to get a position to blow up the head of the Statue of Liberty. Unfortunately, Sly Rax is unseen by the mass team and starts shooting at the pillars that hold up the jetty. And as they start to crumble, the mass team jump out of Rhino, leaving their masts behind the whole jetty comes tumbling down with a rhino on still on top of it. So now we've lost Thunderhawk, it's in for repair, we've lost rhino, and that's the end of this story. So what is going to happen next time? We then move on to another story. Now this obviously is just a, a, a single issue story because it doesn't say if it's uh, part one, part two, part three. Um, so it says Operation Sea Dog, and we see an offshore oil rig in the Atlantic Delta field. And basically there's a helicopter flying in and the people are discussing about the fact of, well we're not expecting any supply, so why is there another helicopter flying in? So it turns out that basically it's Miles Mayhem in Switchblade. So as he lands, um, this guy approaches and he uses some uh, venom from Viper Mass to get rid of this guy. And then he tells the rest of them that if they don't want poison in the same way, then they'll do what they said. We then cut over to Dwayne Kennedy on a big screen speaking to Matt Tracker. And he's informing them that there's this issue with this oil field. They've had this message that no one can make any sense of, which says, flow okay, lifting can go ahead. 
but they don't know what this is for because this actual oil platform was actually being shut down. It was there's no more oil, so we don't understand what's going on. So Matt Tracker turns to Buddy Hawks and says, "Right, let's get Thunderhawk ready to go." So let's move on. Thunderhawk has driven all the way to a coastal town which is near to the water where this oil rig is off the shore. Why have they driven there? Why have they not just flown all the way from Boulder Hill? Would they not have got there quicker? Um, certainly I would have thought they would have got there quicker, you know, driving by car. I don't know what the speed limit would be in America, maybe 55 miles an hour or something like that. So anyway, this scene, this, what well, I say scene, these couple of um, uh, cells here, they remind me, if you've ever seen, read the DC version of the Mass comic, one of the comic strips had Matt Tracker's Thunderhawk being lifted onto an aircraft carrier. And we see a couple of sailors wondering why this millionaire's got his car on the deck. And then he jumps into the car and drives away. And they're like worried that he's going to drive it off the ends of the aircraft carrier and end up in the water. So these two guys are having this conversation with this guy driving off and they, they, they then are bemused by the, uh, the fact that uh, Thunderhawk turns into jet mode and takes off. So it's a similar thing, it's the same, different thing, but uh, very similar. So what then happens is, is as they approach um, the oil platform, we see Miles Mayhem getting onto a radio and saying to Matt Tracker, um, I've put explosives on the legs of this um, uh, oil platform. You wouldn't want the lights of 50 men on your conscience, would you? So Miles Mayhem jumps into Switchblade, takes off, and we see it going from helicopter mode into jet mode and chases after uh, Thunderhawk. So obviously Matt Tracker about turns because he doesn't want um, Miles Mayhem to carry out his threat. But unfortunately, as he's um, contacting Boulder Hill to get some reinforcements sent, uh, Switchblade fires a missile and a stinger rocket at Thunderhawk and we see it hitting and it then becomes damaged. Now luckily there's a nearby um, tanker um, and Matt is able to land on the tanker's surface. But in the meantime, we've discovered that Matt has had a clue to the, uh, the whole thing about the flow and what that means, he's realised that flow backwards is Wolf, which is obviously Miles Mayhem's code name. Now unfortunately for Matt, he's landed in this oil tanker he heads up to see the captain to let him know what's happened and it turns out the Sly Rax and Cliff Dagger are already on board. Now Cliff Dagger is come down a ladder, he doesn't have his mask on, but Sly Rax is already there with stiletto on and we see this brilliant image of these um, stiletto darts coming fly, flying out. Now the darts also come out the chest plate of stiletto and the image of this is just awesome. We just see them coming flying out and that's where we leave it until we go drive on to the next page. So we've arrived just in time to see both uh, Buddy Hawks and Matt Tracker being pinned to a, a container um, a, a wooden crate um, by some of the stiletto darts and basically yeah you know to the point where Buddy's hats even came off and it's against the, the wood so we see Buddy without his hat um, so this is a brown image now as they are pinned there um, we have this discussion about Matt Tracker speaking to them about oil and um, Cliff Dagger says who said anything about oil it's gold we're after. This oil platform is sitting on top of a sunken ship and it's got all this gold in it. So we then see um, Sly Rax jumping into the sub of Piranha. Uh, Piranha seems to be getting used quite a lot in this particular issue of the comic. So it dies off the deck and he goes down and he's collecting up the, um, the gold and putting it into a net. Now we see him outside of the Piranha sub 
just wearing his mask. So that would suggest to us that obviously his mask allows him to breathe underwater. Now it's never been mentioned if that's something that he can or can't do, but certainly in this particular uh, issue of the comic, in this story, we see him underwater with just his mask on, and it seems to be giving him some protection. The next thing, there's this explosion nearby, and what's happened is, based on the fact that uh, Matt's radioed for help, we see Condor has flown in, um, with Brad Turner flying it, with this cable hanging down with our grappling hook, and he's dropped the, uh, the Gator hydroplane in the water right above, and we've also had some um, explosions from there, um, and it's um, Hondo that's driving for some reason. So what then happens is, because he's missed, um, Sly Rax manages to get into the submarine and fire some electric spears, and this then damages the hydroplane. Um, so, for some reason, Sly Rax knows that it's Honda McLean that's piloting, not Dusty Hayes. But anyway, he fires and he, he hits him, and as um, Condor swoops in with a cable to try and get hold of him, Switchblade flies in and then hits Condor, so that's that out of the action as well. So we don't now know what's happened to these guys, because we now move back onto the oil tanker. Miles Mayhem's there, and we see the gold getting lifted up um, into the oil tanker. Miles Mayhem's there, we've got Sly Rax, um, Matt and Buddy have their hands tied behind the backs, and obviously Miles Mayhem is gloating about all this gold he's got. Um, but obviously Matt says, well I don't think you're going to get away with it. He goes, because that's Russian gold and the Russians are here to rescue it as we see a fleet of Russian warships coming towards them. So the Mayhem boys all jump into Switchblade, fly away and the gold is ha handed over to the Russians. Which I think is a very nice thing to do. And that's the end of that story. So let's see what the centre pages have to offer us. Because we did know that it was going to be Rhino based on what it said in the cover. So let's see what we've got. comic, I'm not too sure how that got there. Anyway, Rhino, so as you've seen, I've been driving it all through the review of this comic and it's been absolutely brilliant. I would recommend anyone to have a shot of Rhino. Like I say, luckily enough, it's a right hand drive version that I've got here, um, great for the UK roads and it's been as fabulous to drive it as I thought it would be. So we've got this um, big rig, now in the top left hand corner we have the mask logo. Now, I'm not too sure why, but the logo is black and white, rather than it's normal coloured in. Everything else is coloured in in this page, so I'm not too sure if they just didn't want the logo to distract from the fact that we've got Rhino on the pages, and Rhino is obviously part of the mass logo, or whether it was an oversight, not too sure. But what we have is, we have a hole, obviously where Rhino should be, not, not too sure why that's there. Um, but what we then have is, is we have a Rhino in attack mode, we've got a rocket flying out, um, we've got Matt Tracker um, hanging out of the driver's door of the left hand drive version. Um, and then we've got Bruce Sato sat in the ATV as he quite often is seen in many of the iterations of the comic and the cartoon etc etc. So we find out that the pilot is Matt Tracker, his mask is Ultra Flash. The co-pilot is Bruce Sato, and the mask is Lifter. Now this is all information that we, years down the road, know this information now. However, when we were 13 year old, buying the comet for the first time, we didn't know any of this, so this was great information for us to take on board. So it says classified information. It says, mass heavyweight rig, mobile defence unit. Front grill converts a power ram bumper. Diesel smokestacks convert to 180 degree cannon and the missile launcher in the sleeper cab fires a multi-warhead projectile. The vehicle possesses radar, uh, it's got mobile command centre capabilities, fitted with rear with, with, fitted with the rear smoke screen, also an ejection seat, which we saw in the front cover, well the back cover, 
and rear of the truck converts into an all-terrain vehicle ATV equipped with front-mounted cannons. So all in all, this is a very brilliant, I mean it's the, the image quality of this is fantastic. And I think I said in the last two issues that I had some reservations about the, the drawings there. I didn't quite know what it was. I didn't know if it was the backgrounds, I didn't know what it was. But certainly with this one, with the explosions firing off in the back of um, Rhino, we see Matt hanging out the door, we, we get to see um, Bruce Sato driving along. Okay, his hands aren't in steering it, they're on the outside. Um, but there's just something about this image. So by now we're getting to the point where I'm actually thinking, do you know what, okay, this is brilliant, this, this is just awesome. But I think having had my time in Rhino, I think what I better do is I better fill in that gap and what I to do is I'll see you on the other side of the comic in my normal place. Catch you later. Oh, it was good to get inside, nice and warm. It was a wee bit cold outside with the window down, rolled down and rhino. Um, and part of the reason why I wanted to come inside as well was every time I stopped rhino to chat to you, people would come along and just start looking and saying, what's he doing? Oh, and then I had some people stood right outside the house, right where I was parked, deciding to have a wee chat, because we live in a small village and that's what people in small villages do. And I think they were just being nosy to see what I was actually doing. So I thought, do you know what? Best to park up Rhino, put it back to where it was, get my comic complete again, and then come inside, nice heat, and continue on from there. So we've moved on to the Key of Solomon, part three. Um, this is the first story after the center page spread that we just saw. Um, so if you remember from last week, Buddy Hawks, Master of Disguise, has gone under disguise um, to meet up with Miles Mayhem um, to find out exactly what's going on. Uh, he's gone undercover as this character called The Toff. So what's happened is he's a bit worried that there's this guy turned out who knows The Toff. He's one of The Toff friends. He was in jail with him at Parkhurst uh, Prison. So the guy speaks to The Toff. Everything seems to be going okay. The Buddy's okay with finding out the fact of um, he's got to steal this um, particular statue and he's going to get a further £200,000 sterling once the job's done. So he then goes back uh, to Matt, we see him taking off all of the, the disguise. Um, so he's at Matt Tracker's headquarters. It says Matt Tracker's headquarters, it doesn't say if it's Boulder Hill, it doesn't say if it's Matt Tracker's mansion, it doesn't actually let us know what it is, but why would we go from Paris all the way back to America, not too sure if we'd even have enough time to do that. So this um, treasure expert, Mr Hansard, is still there, so we see Matt Tracker speaking to him, um, and the guy says, oh yeah, the person that um, Mr Hawks describes with Miles Mayhem can only be one man, a Professor Mulcahy, um, or Mad Mulcahy as he's frequently known. Um, Mulcahy has spent uh, his life trying to find the Key of Solomon, a legendary book, and apparently the pages have been split up and put everywhere around the world. Um, so basically Mulcahy must have found out where the pages were hidden and he's joined forces with Miles Mayhem is the speculation from Matt Tracker. So Buddy then asks, well, what is the Key of Solomon? If it's so important, what exactly is the Key of Solomon? Um, so, Mr. Hansard goes, it's an ancient book showing how to summon demons that will allow the users to find hidden treasure and control the wills of men. Will it control the wills of women? <sighs> Wild horses. Um, so, um, so, Matt says, that sounds right up Mayhem Street. I'm sure I believe in the book, but I'm taking no chances. So, they manage to find out who exactly has this false Kali of the Kush. And Matt Tracker 
obviously he's got plenty of money, makes an arrangement and he goes and buys it from the guy who actually has it. Now, lucky the guy's a bit greedy, he wasn't going to sell it, but, you know, he's been offered $50,000, so yeah, that he's handing that over. So as we see um, Matt walking away with it under his arm, this guy we see kissing the cheque that he's just been given. So when we get back... Uh, they put it on the night cream machine and we see the fact that there's a couple of bits of parchment inside this statue. So, four days later, uh, Buddy Hawks, in disguise again, is taking this um, this figurine to Miles Mayhem to meet up with him. So what happens is, is as he's walking through Paris, he gets accosted by this professor and also by this uh, friend of the Toffs. And obviously the guy has realised that this isn't the Toff because of something that's been said in the past. So he takes off Buddy Hawk's disguise with the professor's having a look at the the couche. Um, now Buddy Hawks tries to fight back and he runs away taking off bits of his um, disguise at, on the run. But these two guys run after him. He then says some police, well he says police but he's in Paris so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming he means gendarmes but which are the poli French police I guess. Um, and he comments on the fact that if only it had penetrator, if he had penetrator, put that on, he'd get away from them, run through buildings, do whatever but unfortunately can't. So he gets to the police and instead of telling the police what's happened, he makes some stupid comment about the police being the problem and take me to your leader um, to try and get arrested, I guess, uh, for some police protection. What then happens is, is Miles Mayhem turns up wearing Viper, we've got Cliff Dagger wearing Torch and Sly Rax wearing a Stiletto. So as he's speaking with the police, um, we see Miles Mayhem activating Viper on the gendarmes and he hits one of them. Uh, we then see uh, Rax firing a uh, stiletto and a bit like the previous uh, comic what he's done is he's fired his darts and pinned this guy against a, a wooden door um, and as the third policeman tries to escape um, and get into his police car um, um, Cliff Dagger decides to use Torch to blow the police car up which isn't the best idea because as it explodes there's this Below and fire everywhere, and um, he gets cursed by uh, Miles Mayhem for almost blowing all of them up. However, they do manage to get a hold of Buddy Hawks and run away. Now, I'm not too sure exactly what's going on on these pages because um, this professor guy and the other guy seem to have kind of disappeared from these pages as this has all gone on. And what then happens is we then turn to our mass team. So we've got Bruce, we've got Matt, and we've got, um, uh, we have Brad. So what happens is, is we've got uh, Thunderhawk, we've got Rhino, we see Gator, and we see, um, we see Condor. Now, Gator is sat there, but in the next cell, as they're driving along, we don't see it. Anywhere, I'm not too sure exactly why Gator's not kind of gone anywhere. Um, but what happens is, is Matt says to Bruce, "You take Thunderhawk. I'm going to take Rhino because Rhino's got more sophisticated um, homing equipment in it." Um, and they go looking after, uh, they go looking for Buddy Hawks. They've put a homing beacon inside the Cali the Kush, but when they get to where the homing beacon is, they've realised that it's, it's already been broken. The homing beacon's been left, and they find the wig that uh, Buddy Hawks was wearing in disguise so they know that obviously something has happened to him and then we'll not quite find out until the next issue which says next demons so we then have this advert that seems to be in every single issue so far uh, the one with Rhino firing at Switchblade so as we turn over we have the normal letters page now I might be a bit of a sceptic it's not been on the go that long, the comic, and we already have all of these letters. I've often wondered, did they already have letters at this stage? Um, or whether it was a case of some of the writers or some of the production people actually made up some of these letters um, in order to give answers to them. I really don't know. I, I would be interested to find out. I know that someone did contact me a while back and say that they had a letter 
or a or a piece of artwork, I think it was maybe, that featured in one of the comics and asked me if I knew which one it was. I never got around to looking into it for them, so I do apologise if you're watching and you're that person. Um, I just didn't have access to my comics at the time to look for you, I'm afraid. Um, so we've got the mass section of the letters edited by Matt Tracker. Um, thanks for all your letters and drawings. Here at Mask Headquarters, we've almost been swamped. Below, I'm printing a selection of what we've received. Each reader who has published, who has a letter published or a drawing wins £5. I've got a lot of postal orders waiting for future winners. So don't delay, write today to the address at the foot of this page. And then we've got the section by uh, Miles Mayhem that says, Ignore the rubbish of Ma that Matt Tracker is talking on the other side of this page. It was me who got the most letters. I counted them. Well, if you counted the mask ones, why not burn them then, Miles? Um, that's what I would have thought you would have done. Um, the ones printed below are far better than the mask letters, and that drawing of Switchblade is brilliant. I've told the post office to be prepared for an avalanche of letters from you, so get writing and drawing. So we do have a picture of Switchblade that's been drawn by a David Leslie of Manchester. Um, we have uh, someone's written in a Nicholas Street of Bovingdon, Hertfordshire. Um, who's created some words using the, the words mask and venom um, so they've came up with some words from that. We also have the next word in our collector word series so we've got the 13 words this word is over but we've also, also got to wait till we get them all so we can go ahead. Now if you remember from issue 1 and issue 2 um, we got a free gift in those comics uh, the first one was an ultra flash um, cardboard cut out mask and the second one was a viper um, cut out mask. So in this one we don't have a free gift. There's It's just a normal comic, there was no exterior polythene wrapping, there was no free gift, nothing. And to be fair that's kind of the way I like it. I don't know what things are like in America if you're watching from there but certainly in the UK one of the things that really annoys me over here at the moment is is I've got two boys. I would love to buy them some comics. But there's no such thing really as a comic like this anymore. They're all sort of magazine style comics where some of it is comics, some of it's like quizzes and the next thing and other stuff. And to be fair, there's very little content about them that I actually would pay for. The other thing as well is is in the UK, almost every single comic or magazine has to have a free gift. Now, you and I both know it's not free. The cost of this gift is added into the price in the, the, the comic. So this comic here, back in 1986, was 35p. A comic these days is about £3.50, £4, comes wrapped in cellophane and comes with some cheap, crappy toy that's... Phew, you basically take it out and it's destroyed as soon as you take it out because it's such cheap rubbish. I would rather just buy a comic. Now, I don't think my sons are old enough for things like Marvel or DC or IDW comics. And certainly I think they're a bit, you know, because they're a bit more adult. And also those type of comics are the small ones that, you know, we've already discussed previously, the size difference between the UK mass comic and other comics, you know, made by DC and whatever. So in this particular one, we have this Matt Tracker mask. And I'll put it up over here. Okay, so as I said, we don't have a free mask in this issue, but what we have is is this whole page that says Matt Tracker Mask Spectrum. So we've also already got the Ultra Flash mask. Now we have this Spectrum mask, which I'm assuming that the comic is wanting you to cut out. I mean, it says on the front cover, make your own mask, special coloured page inside. So I'm guessing the idea is, is you're meant to cut it out, stick it on cardboard, and then turn it into a mask in the same way as the, the ones that you got free. Now, all I would say to that is, is if you did do that, if you did cut that out, then I think you should really be ashamed of yourself of damaging such a great comic as this and cutting out a whole page. That, to me, is just sacrilege. And it's one thing that I would say, if you're trying to buy some UK mass comics, always make sure that you've got the front cover 
because some people pull that off. The centre page spread, as we saw Rhino, this this uh, issue. Things like this as well, the mask as well, because some people will have cut that out, pulled out, put on the bedroom wall, done whatever. Um, I didn't, because obviously, uh, you know, I just wouldn't even consider doing that. I mean, in this day and age, it'd be easy enough to take a photocopy of that, print it out and do that if you wanted, but certainly back in those days, you never had that luxury. Um, and it would have been very expensive to get someone to do that for you, especially if it's colour. You know, I mean, you could trace it, I guess, and then f do it yourself. That would have been an option. That would have been preferable um, to doing that, but anyway. So, now that my rant is finished about comics and free gifts that are rubbish and destroying comics, uh, we move on to part three of War of Venom. So we've got the blue tinge, I think, in the last issue. It was green, which kind of fitted with the, with the war machine that was going on. So we were left in the last issue with Alex Etta taking flight um, using um, Jackrabbit and I did wonder what exactly was it going to do if he's come up against a plane in Jackrabbit Jackrabbit doesn't have any weapons its speciality is flying that's all it has so what's happened is we have this jet coming flying towards Alex Etter as he's flying along it then starts to fire at him and also what we can see is is well he's obviously going to die isn't he but as the bullets get closer they just disappear and we're left wondering well what happens even Alex Hector is confused by this these bullets were heading towards me why, 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 why am I not dead so it turns out that as the bullets have disappeared that basically we've got Brad Turner flying about in Condor and as we know Condor where the headlight is has an antimatter ray so the antimatter ray has destroyed all of these bullets that were heading towards uh, and now relieved Alex Hector because he's not dead so the um, the jet flies away and as Al as they say, as Brad says, well, he's turning tail because he knows what I can do to bullets with my antimatter ray. Just imagine what I could do to him and his jet. Um, so as they're chatting away, Alex mentions the planes and he's going, well, those bombers are almost at the top of the Sanjurian town. We've got to stop them. So they're a bit concerned about this. However, what Brad says is, is negative. The rest of the team will handle the bombers. We've got to deal with those tanks. So there's a whole load of tanks on the ground. And also, we can't leave them all to Hondo and Dusty. So we then see Hondo McLean and Dusty Hayes standing, facing off a whole load of tanks. Um, with Dusty, with his, his, his normal southern accent, Hot dog, Hondo. Those tanks just keep coming and are coming. And Hondo replies back, there's nowhere to run, Dusty, so we might as well stand our ground. So, they obviously do stand their ground. We see uh, Hondo using um, his blaster mask. He gets rid of some of the tanks. Then we see um, Alex Hector and we see Condor flying in um, to help out. And Alex Hector decides to fly across in front of the tanks to draw the fire away in the hope that they will take aim at him and he'll be able to avoid them. So that then gives uh, Dusty Hayes enough time to get back to Gator and he turned around like, Hondo, where's Hondo? Oh, I've lost Hondo. But luckily, Alex Hector has swooped in to save the day and Hondo McLean is on his back, a bit like Superman's cape flying about. So as, as uh, Dusty tries to drive away in Gator, unfortunately a shell goes off and it causes Gator to flip over. And he falls out. So what then happens is, is um, Buddy Hawks and Rhino's been assessing the situation and he says, Dusty's in trouble. I'll have to use Rhino's all-terrain vehicle to get to him. So he jumps into the ATV, he drives along, and the ATV charges along the battlefield in front of the mounted cannons blazing. But, he says, I'll never make it in time. I'll have to take the direct route. So you then see him driving right past the front, he says, through the tanks. But we don't actually see him driving through the tanks. We see him knocking people over and whatever. But we don't actually see him physically f uh, going through the tanks at this point. But what's happened is Alex Hector, from his point of view, up in the air, can see that Dusty Hayes is now dazed and confused. He thinks he's back in his uh, kitchen cooking pizzas. Then we see him rolling about on the floor and he's about to get squished. And then it says, next, showdown. 
So then we have some information about next page, uh, next time, and it says big cover picture of Jack Hammer versus Thunderhawk, big center page poster, Condor, mass amazing motorcycle helicopter, big story action, exciting conclusions to War of Venom and the Key of Solomon, big prizes to one, five pounds for each of your letters published, big rush for next issue, on sale in two weeks, beat the demand, order your copy at your paper shop. Now luckily I did already have my copy um, saved, um, ordered, so I always got it every fortnight and eventually every week. Now what I will say is issue 3, by this point I'm now hooked. The cover with Rhino, the centre pages with Rhino, Rhino itself being fantastic. And there was just something about this comic, I think this was the turning point where I just said, yep, I like this. This is a brilliant comic. So what to do is, I'll go just now. Um, I might have some outtakes at the end because when I was on the outside, um, it was it was a bit wild. But anyway, I'll go there now. I can put the outtakes on. I will. If not, hopefully I'll see you again. Bye. Okay, so that's us driven into the next page. So what's happening is on another slope, there's now a torrent of cascading uh, molten rock, and it's about to hit the village of Geshmil, which is where the museum was that uh, the trackers were visiting. So basically they drop a proton bomb, and it creates a big channel for all the lava to go into to, do, to divert it. So that's brilliant. So we're now getting to the point where the lava is now being moved away from all the villages and stuff. So what then happens is we then see sly racks coming out from the, the caves after blowing it up. And Cliff Dagger doesn't quite understand the objective here. So it's got to be explained to him that basically Miles Mayhem has got this book. And this book is explaining to him what exactly is going on. So they're hoping to melt all the ice, get rid of all the trees and do everything so that the giant of Geshmil will become free so they can then take over. Right boys, just head in. Thanks. You take them in, buddy, yeah? Yeah, but Max won't leave the stick. Max, you leave the stick outside, buddy. You'll get it later. <sighs> Where the um, oil rig is, just offshore. And they're deciding to take off from there. Why didn't they just take off from Boulder Hill? We did not have got there a lot quicker. I don't know, I'm not too sure why that is. Now, for those of you who have read the DC Mass comics, this might look familiar to you. In one of the stories, basically, they are on an aircraft carrier, and there's a couple of sailors who can't understand why this rich millionaire has got his car on this aircraft carrier with him. And then they get the shock of their lives when he actually drives it off, and it turns into flight mode, and then it flies away. So this is a similar thing. It's not the same story, but it's a similar kind of thing. So as they take off, these guys are left in bewilderment. So they head towards the um, the oil platform, but Miles Mayhem warns them that he's already put some dynamite um, explosives on the legs of the structure, and he wouldn't want Matt Tracker to be responsible for the deaths of all these men who are still on this oil platform. So what happens is, is we see uh, Switchblade taken off and convert into jet mode to race after Thunderhawk. 
So as it's racing after it, you see a bomb exploding. And he started like held his breath. So like you feel like wrong. And then I went, I went, let me see you. No, 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 no. Smurf. Smurf. Ah. Bloody hell, cat. <laughs>